evening, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to the ninth of our pre-performance talks and the 26th of our uh, free event, <laughs> free, no, we're only half, in July, um, halfway through all of the events that are to support the extraordinary range of programmes and shows that are on in this 50th anniversary season. Um, my name is Kate Moss and I'm a novelist and have written the CFT book, which I'm allowed to uh, promote because all the royalties go to the theatre. So all of you who haven't got one, you can buy one on the way out. Um, anyway, it is my great pleasure this evening to be doing a slightly different pre-performance talk in this wonderful new space, Theatre on the Fly. Um, and everything about tonight is about celebrating the 50 years of Chichester Festival Theatre and looking to the future. But of course, we cannot help but feel in the dim and distant past, 1962, summers were sunny. Some of you remember that first season, and it was sunny. And everybody has made many jokes about the fact that all of this is the youth theatre's fault, because in this very theatre they are performing Noah. So there we go. Anyway, this evening we've got a about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, both of my esteemed guests are going to be going to see Heartbreak House, and I know some of you are. So we will talk for about an hour and then do 10 minutes of questions at the end. Um, one of our guests will be joining us in a moment. So on my immediate left is Michael Billington, who is the longest serving theatre critic. I'm tempted to say in the world, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> Certainly in the UK. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. It's like Michael started at the Times um, and was there from 1965 to 1971 and then has been at The Guardian since 1971. He's also one of the London correspondents for the New York Times. He is a biographer. He has written many critical works, not least of all the wonderful State of the Nation, which, if you'll forgive the vulgar phrase, if you want a one-stop shop about British theatre since 1945, that is the book to buy when obviously you've bought your CFT book to give money to the fund. Um, on my far left is another one of our great critics, Nicholas de Jong. Nick is currently, uh, was the senior drama critic at the Evening Standard from 1991 to 2009, and before that was at The Guardian, um, and also reviews very widely in other places. He is an author um, of two critical works, but most importantly, in a way, um, is a poacher termed gamekeeper and has recently been writing plays, in particular, The Wonderful Plague Over England. Um, now, we've got also got Libby Purvis, who will be on my right. She is in seeing The Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui and will make a dramatic entrance um, <laughs> at about 20 past five. Uh, she also has had a very long and distinguished career at the BBC in particular as a producer and as a presenter. You'll all know her from midweek. Um, she received an OBE for journalism in 1999 and she is the author of several novels and books but in 2010 was appointed the Times drama critic. So that will be our panel and one by one um, we will just sort of get going. So I'm going to start with the I'm afraid rather obvious question is um, Michael and Nick both of you have long associations with Chichester so when was the very first time you came here Michael? Summer 1962. Yes. Yay! <laughs> Golden summer. It was actually, I can remember, I was working in Lincoln at the time. I was something called public liaison officer for the Lincoln Theatre Royal, which actually was a very distinguished company, and Penelope Keith was one of its big names, but well, she wasn't a big name then, but she was a company member, Anna Carteret, whom I saw last night, was also in the company. So there was no mean theatre. Anyway, I was working there, and I'd booked my tickets for Chichester. I drove down in my mini, supplied by the Gulbenkian Foundation, all the way from Lincoln, I didn't drive very well. Um, it was a long, long journey on a hot July afternoon. And I remember getting here, I had nowhere to stay, and I saw this wonderful place which I've just passed, the Bluebell Inn at Cocking. And I thought, that looks nice, I'll stay there. I booked in for the Friday and Saturday. I saw the chances on the Friday night. Uh, Saturday afternoon, I went to see the Broken Heart. I felt rather lonely. There weren't many of us at the Broken Heart that <laughs> afternoon, actually. Lawrence Olivier... It's because it was sunny, Michael. Ah, uh, acting as hard as It was actually yeah. ser seriously under-patronised. And then, of course, in the evening, you can guess, I went to see Uncle Vanya. And I can safely say I can remember that performance in microscopic detail. And the problem when I see Uncle Vanya today is not hearing 
the sound, the inflections of Laurence Olivier, Michael Redgrave, Joan Plowright, above all, in that final speech. I mean, that performance, as anyone who saw it will know, is imprinted on one's memory. And it's a kind of gold standard by which one judges all other Uncle Vanyas. Um, I remember meeting an actor friend, Richard Hampton, who I think was understudying in that company, and he said, Michael, every night it's done here, it's holy night. You know, and there was that, he said, backstage, it's holy night. There was a kind of awe about it, because everyone knew they were in something memorable. Um, and I remember, I was 22 at the time, and I found in Uncle Vanya an echo of my own sort of, I don't know, youthful frustration and unhappiness, etc. And I find it's one of those plays, whatever age you are, you always find someone to identify with, you know. First of all, it was Vanya with his sense of a wasted life. Now it's the old professor I will find. <laughs> How I identified with Sonia, I think. Oh, yes. <laughs> I feel like the writing machine, you know, the old professor who's written and written and written and no one pays the slightest attention That's quite to what sad he's when you're only a young man. <laughs> well, I, I, no, now, now. Oh, now, now I now, see it. No, no, no. That would Over be dreadful the, if you're only 22 no, and you were feeling I, like that. First I was Vanya, then I was Astroff, oh. and now I'm Sir, Sir Bryakov. Anyway, I mean, it was unforgettable. And I suppose it did instill in me... Uh, a f an affection for this place, this building, this idea. And so I came back the second season to see Vanya all over again uh, and to see a play which you may touch on, The Workhouse Donkey by yes. John Ogg, which no one but me liked, no. actually. So I was, there, I was there at the beginning and I've been pretty much out uh, to every single season, not to every production, but every mm. single season for the last 50 years. Oh, amazing. So I'm a veteran. Of you are a veteran. Are, are there any other people who were here at the first season? I think there are in the audience. Oh. Quite a lot, actually, yes. Sussex yes. people live long. That's, that's the answer <laughs> oh, to right. that. <laughs> now, Nick, you also actually came that very first season, didn't you? It was a slightly different story for you. Yeah, slightly di different. Well, I, I th my life has been, in a sense, bounded by Chichester Theatre. It means an overwhelming amount to me. The last play I reviewed as a critic was uh, Noel Card, Dinah Rigg, in that little, little play about the Bliss family. And in 1962, I was at school in London, and five or six of us came down to see all three plays. And I remember I, I'd seen very little theater indeed, and what I'd seen stood out for me. But seeing Uncle Vanya was something, and I, I don't like to be repetitive uh, <laughs> after Michael, uh, but I too, and I've got a much worse memory than he has, I too can remember the whole process of this play, which I didn't know at all. And from the moment Sybil Thorndike came on and looked at Laurence Olivier, and perhaps one brings back now a little more than was then and knowing the relationship between Olivier and Thorndike. But even so, each detail of that night haunted my memory and has ever since. Michael Redgrave gave one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. I've never seen a better Vanya and the moment when just before he pulls the pistol and talks about his wasted life. I have never heard such shocked and furious vehemence. I, I imagine it related quite a lot to Redgrave's own rather tormented life. And at one point, I, I disagree with M Michael, I found Joan Plowright, Sonia, too rhetorical and attention, self, uh, self-seeking attention. But, but that apart, it, it fired me with my passion for theater. And the broken heart had a similar strange impact on me in the sense that I found myself writing down line after line of this unknown playwright. And I still remember, and I remembered 
a year or two later when I got an interview at university, they are the silent griefs that cut the heartstrings. And I quoted it to them, and they didn't know where it came from. <laughs> and I said, John Ford, don't you know John Ford? And it was rather nice to see these two grand and unpleasant <laughs> academics look slightly ashamed of themselves, and I got, got in. Uh, the third play, The Chances, was it didn't matter. But seeing all those great old actors, and some merely in middle age, fired me with a passion which never left. And as I said, my life of fascination with the theatre is bounded by that and seeing as my final review, what, as I suddenly can't, hey, oh, hey fever, hey fever. Hey, hey fever. <laughs> and I remember thinking as I watched it in amazed sadness that it's the most perfect play for me because it's about people who want to live their life as theater and escape reality. And that is always what I've wanted to do. And so Chichester fired me irrevocably. And, we and that's why a, I yes, adore the place. A theatre made from reclaimed materials in a deluge. I feel that we are <laughs> achieving that. Yes. Um, but, but in fact, what is so interesting about that first season, and we, we saw actually quite a lot of people were there, is that there is a narrative about it, which is that the theatre was built by the community, for the community. It was built on a shoestring. There were many things that meant it nearly didn't open on time. And then the first two plays were disappointing, people didn't come, and that Vanya saved the day. Do you think that sort of, if you like, almost legend about how the theatre started and just managed to cling on by its fingernails because of this, this one play right. ha has been a benefit for Chichester, you know, this idea of this perfect season, uh, that perfect Vanya at the beginning, or actually a bit of a negative thing? Well, it well, wasn't I, a perfect season, was it? No, I mean, I, do, I doubt Olivier planned to have two flops and then have a triumph. No, I mean... I mean, that, I think the point about that season, and I think something about the image of Chichester we haven't mentioned yet, the glamour of it, and that was what attracted me initially. I mean, I, although I was working in the theatre, working in Lincoln, I didn't know that much about the actual you know, financing of it. What I knew was, here was a season with Laurence Olivier, Michael Redgrave, Sybil yeah. Thorndike, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and younger actors, you know, John Neville in The Chances, I remember. Um, so it was, it, was the, it was the whole glamour of the company. And in my case, I have to say, um, an obsession both with Laurence Olivier and Michael Redgrave. I'd right. seen Olivier at Stratford in the 1950s when I was very young, um, doing his Macbeth and his Titus. And I became obsessed by the, the sort of mystery of this extraordinary mm. actor who could transmogrify into anything. So it was Olivier and Redgrave whom I admired equally. Those were the things that drew me, and I think Obviously, it, it matters that the Avania was a great success, um, but I think there would have been a, you know, there would have been a second season. It, Chichester would way. have recovered, yes. even if they'd had a middling success with the Avania. One thing, though, that was very striking, Ken Tynan, who was then very influential as drama critic of the Zerva, after the first two productions, wrote a stinging column, which I still remember, attacking Olivier, Chichester, uh, the theatre itself, who put the hex on the hexagon, he said. He said it was an unworkable stage. And it was a foul piece in many ways. And the story goes that Olivier read it, uh, and it was very influential in getting time and the job of literary manager at the National Theatre. Because he said it's easier to have Tynan on the inside <laughs> pissing out than on the outside pissing in, you know. So... Yeah. A lot of things happened because of that first season, obviously. And, of course, there was an announcement pretty much the day that the theatre opened that Olivier, the National Theatre, was going to happen and Olivier was going to be the chap. Um, and that looked as if that could have been a derailing, but actually it became there for a nascent National Theatre company it's, here. I think it sealed Chichester's success with a sort of glamorous chic, which it is not altogether lost, though it's, it's got had since other very positive things and some ne negative as well. Uh, I mean, 
I disagree about the broken heart. I know it. Did, I, I know it didn't do well. I know it got a lot of bad reviews. I can still remember reading Tynan's dismissal of it and suddenly thinking what a fool he was. It was probably the first <laughs> and on, only time that happened. But I think it's that first scene uh, season with the broken heart was an indication of the fact, and it became rare for a time and then came back, that Chichester could, for all its star-studded, glamorous image and its conservative image that it acquired after Olivier had gone, still managed to surprise us with amazing things. And obviously, today, it has shaken off that past of conventional glamorous, old-fashioned theatre and has got something different. But I think it always had the capacity to surprise us. Yeah, right. one, one thing Olivier did, and one should never forget this, of course, was do new plays. Yeah. Big, bold, new plays. Not always successfully. I mean, the failure in the second season, I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, failure commercially was a play by John Arden called The Workhouse Donkey. Did anyone see that, I wonder? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. yes. For there me, is for, another lady agrees with you. This uh, for me, it is one of the golden memories. Because <laughs> it, was all, <laughs> it was all, it was possibly the first time I'd ever seen what one called an epic State of England play, a State of the Nation yeah. play. So obviously it had a big effect on me. I'd never seen a play that in, uh, tried to put the whole of a society onto a stage and did it with a sort of raucous Dionysiac fervour. There was music, dancing, strip clubs. I mean, everything was corru civic corruption, which in... The England in the 60s was a very, very newsworthy item. It still is. It still is. It still is. Um, he ain't learned nothing. And I, I, I said this in the book, actually, but I remember going to matinee when I came down yeah. the second year, and again, it was ill-attended. Who was sitting in front of me? Laurence Olivier. Uh, yeah. And during the action, a hot summer afternoon, there was someone playing a radio, a portal radio outside the theatre, and Olivier, you could see tensing. I, I could see his muscles tense, and he rushed out of the theatre. Uh, to silence the dreadful radio and then came back in again, which said a lot about Olivier, I thought, mm. this sort of hands-on approach to running a theatre. But, I mean, the workhouse donkey in that first or second season, but then soon after, the Royal Hunt of the Sun, yeah. which was, you all know, a colossal <laughs> yeah. success. So, I mean, and Armstrong's Last Good Night, also by John Arden, less remembered. So I was very impressed by the way in those early Olivier years, there was always a big new play of yeah. a kind which other theatres could not mm. easily stay. But then it changed with John, Cle John Clement's arrival, took it back to a 1950s glamorous theatre, didn't it? He did. I mean, I think John Clement's, well, we, no, he was a different animal uh, oh, to Lawrence Olivier in every yeah. sense. I mean, he was more conservative by temperament. Yeah. And Chichester... I mean, at the time, the early 70s, wasn't it? Late yeah. 70s, early 70s. Late 60s, early late 70s. Yeah. Yeah. I was probably quite critical of the John Clements regime. Yeah. Now I have to confess, at my age, I look back with a kind of fond nostalgia <laughs> to straightforward revivals of plays by Shaw. Don above Dice. All. Oh, yeah, yes. you know, without too many heavy concepts yes. uh, to, to rewrite the play. Mm. I speak before Heartbreak House tonight, of course. Yes. Um, so actually, in the end, perhaps it wasn't so bad after all. It just seemed after the Olivier glamour yes. as an excess, yeah. a slightly more conservative but ethos. I, but I think one, I mean, there, there are so many things that we're, I want to cover in yeah. the, but one of them that you've touched on immediately is the issue of stars and Chichester yeah. and whether Chichester needs them more than other places or doesn't, whether it makes it harder to do certain sorts of plays. And you've talked, both of you, about particular performances do you think Chichester is different in this original star-led casting and having to deal with how you... Hooray! Hooray, yes. Yeah. I'm talking about star casting, and Libby. Here she comes. <laughs> Libby Purvis, everyone. A star. <laughs> We're just talking about the, um, the debates that there have been at Chichester about the, either the need to or the need not to have big, big stars in the plays. So you can get your breath back and I'll pour you some water <laughs> while Michael and Nick deal with that one. Well, I think uh, it's quite wrong to suggest that Chichester is simply a centre in search of a collection of stars. The very same thing, I mean, if Duncan Weldon was here, I, and he's not, I can see he's not. I mean, 
Yeah. Are you here, Duncan? No, he's not. No, he's not. I can, <laughs> I can see. Uh, would confirm this. Every single West End producer worth his salts looks for stars, depends on stars, dreams of stars, longs for stars. It's always the longed-for basis of any production. I just think, for a period, Chichester had the Olivier fashionability, and to an extent, um, I suppose Clements had a residue of it. And I think that started the tradition of stars here, but it was not something new at all. I, I, no, I mean, I'm with you. I am all for stars, because stars on the whole tend to be the very best actors. Uh, I mean, last night I was watching Henry Goodman in Arturi, oh, a play you couldn't oh, do without a star. No. Tonight we're seeing Derek Jacobi in Heartbreak House. Again, a star actor, a star vehicle, star, star play. My point would be this, though. I think if you can guarantee the presence of stars, that gives you the license to do something bold. Yeah. And that's what I liked about Olivier. Yes, he could get the very best actors. So having, knowing he'd get Albert Finney, he gets him to do yeah. a play like Armstrong's Last Good Night. Um, again, he gets you know, star names in the workhouse donkey. Frank Finney, perhaps not a big star then, but a, a rising star. So I think Chichester should pursue star actors. But I think having got them, it should then use them in adventurous... Uh, projects, either new writing or less familiar classics. I think yeah. it, a theatre only gets a bit dull when it gets the, both the star names and the same tried and trusted vehicles. And that has happened in the history of Chichester, I think. Waters of the Moon, 1977 by N.C. Hunter, Hunter, with yes. two big stars. Couldn't do that play without a star, yes, could you? Yes. I mean, I just think there was a time, we may get into this, when Chichester began to fall into kind of identikit seasons, when there'd be a morm a coward, a Pinero, and maybe if it was really bold and rash, a play by Anwi, you know. Um, <laughs> but I think Chichester has, and I'll come back to this later, has always been at its best when it's been at its bravest. And I think Chichester should use its star yeah. magnetism, yeah, as I it were, to you. do adventurous work. Speaking of, there was a very funny story with Lauren Bacall, apparently, that Duncan Weldon says, and which I put in the book, which is that she was very, very irritated on Sunday morning <laughs> that the bells were keeping her awake and demanded that Duncan Weldon went and asked the cathedral to stop ringing them. <laughs> he said, matter them, they have been ringing bells here for a thousand years. Um, but, you know, it's and she said, well, get them stopped. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, no, but I think also, you know, Derek Jacobi, of course, appearing across the way, he was here in that second season. So the point that there is that the star at the top and then the opportunities for younger actors, they're yeah. not all stars when they start, Indeed. are they? Indeed. No, absolutely. But it's been a very deb big debate because it's that sense of um, getting the names outside of London. We're back in that sort of time now, but there have been times when that's, you know, particularly, I would, it, I would say, television, would you say, that a lot of stars didn't want to be out of London. Yeah, but I mean, we, we now know the reality is if you want to do a straight play almost anywhere these days, when you seriousness, you've actually got to have a name mm. that is familiar to the public, whether through television or cinema or theatre. So, I mean, I think you just you should pursue its star policy rigorously. Okay. We'll all tell Jonathan when we go in. He'll right. love our input, I think. Libby, did you want to say something? Well, there's, there's the absolute practical thing that you just get attention if you've got a star name. I mean, a very good example for that today, that, that I was not uh, originally supposed to be writing overnight for the news pages about the short tonight, uh, but suddenly they squeaked, it's got Jacoby in it. Why didn't you <laughs> tell me? And I said, because I'd forgotten. <laughs> because I was doing so many other things this week and I'd been thinking about the play and I'd forgotten to actually look at the cast. They said, well, in that case, you're doing it overnight and it's on the news pages. Now, this is, this is good. The more things you get onto news pages of newspapers about theatre, the more sort of excited everybody mm. gets. Obviously, you don't want the kind of star casting which takes some rag and a bone and a hank of hair off the telly or off the pop circuit and just bungs them in. But as Michael's saying, you know, you get these terrific actors and then you get a buzz about the place and then you get lots of other people who want to come and then you get other stars being kind of built in and people start to trust Chichester. I mean, it was very interesting at the Arturo Ui just now. I think, I mean, I was listening to people in the interval as I sometimes do and um, it was quite obvious that quite a few wouldn't have gone within a hundred miles of a Brecht play they didn't know but they love Henry Goodman, as everybody should. And everyone was coming out saying, 
I wasn't expecting that. Uh, <laughs> and if, if, if a name can help you do that, that's great. You know, I, mean, I think it's terrific. I also think Chichester makes stars and it can, it can turn stars in slightly different directions. Look at Adam Cooper. You know, everybody yes, knew he was a yes. great dancer, but nobody knew what a superstar he was on the musical stage until Singing in the Rain happened, and now, now you, you, know, you have to fight to get in in London. So I think you can, you can build stars, but I do agree you need to have this... Uh, you, you need a buzz in a place, especially when it is out of London, and, and I think that uh, you know, Chichester's star system has helped the buzz. Mm. And it's one of those things when we were doing the book, it was extraordinary how many people had started here, whether it was Sam Mendes as a director and Nick Heitner, one of his very first plays as opposed to opera, or indeed Stephen Fry and Derek Jacobi themselves. Um, so I'm now going to just move you towards yourselves as critics, as opposed to your, you know, your love of Chichester, which is great. But um, when you go and review a play, and I'd like each of you to answer this, where do you see your responsibility? Is it to yourself as a, a representative of audiences? Is it to the theatre, because you know that a good review can make all the difference? Is it to the playwright, what they might have intended? Or do you have nothing other than entertain me? How, how do you approach it? Do you want to start, Michael? Uh, as the oldest, you mean, yes. Um, uh, absolutely, yes, as quite. the Vanya. No, no, you're no, not no. Vanya anymore. I've <laughs> forgotten where you off. are. Yeah, the yes. professor. Um, no, it is, one's responsibility is certainly not to the audience. One is not a representative of the audience. Um, one is not there to take a straw poll and sort of get their uh, reactions. Uh, one isn't there, actually, in a sense, to serve, quotes, the theatre. Uh, one isn't giving notes to the actors and director and designer about, you know, what they should do to get this right. One's responsibility is, A, to the blank screen in front of one, and to one's own integrity. I can't put it any more simply than that. To the truth of one's response. And, I mean, I'm sure Libby and Nick wouldn't fundamentally disagree with this. Um, a critic has to be honest and truthful to their reaction to the event in front of them. That is actually the sole, and almost the only responsibility of the critic, not to second guess what the public will think, not to second guess what your editor might think, but to be true to yourself. And if you're true to yourself, then hopefully the, the words will come. If you try and fake a response to something, I think you're gonna be stymied from the start. Um, Libby tonight, well, she can speak for herself. I mean, we'll be, I won't be doing it tonight, but Libby will. And Libby's responsibility will be to her reaction as she comes out of the theatre, I presume. I think the, the interesting thing is though, that there are sometimes some quite heated um, and, and potentially violent arguments between critics about what we're actually for, because some feel very strongly that they are basically quality control. In other words, that they are <laughs> almost sort of schoolmasterish towards it. And uh, some right at the other end of the spectrum sort of say, no, you know, what we're there for is to write an entertaining column telling people what they might enjoy. Uh, but I don't think either of those things actually works. I think you have to be somewhere weirdly balanced in the middle. It's interesting, as Michael says, you cannot be dishonest. It's not possible. For this reason, if a play was written by or had a very close friend or relative of mine in it, I would probably stay away from the reviewing because you can't lie. It, it sort of doesn't work. You can't sit there sort of saying, oh, five stars, what a wonderful night, you know, when actually it was an awful night for you. But I think what you're there to say is what it was like in that theatre on that night. And you're sometimes giving a lot of clues. You're saying to people, well, I love this, and if this is the kind of thing you love, you're going to love it. But on the other hand, my review may give you quite a lot of clues to show that it's not the kind of thing you like at all. I think I've sometimes given very good reviews to things which have put some people off because they can tell what kind of thing it is and that it's not their taste. That's the consumer end of it, and that's quite a small end of it. But really, I like that the Tynan line, he just sort of says a critic should, I, I haven't got the exact quote in my head, um, should, um, while honestly admitting to any personal prejudices, should chronicle what it was like in that particular playhouse on that particular evening as honestly, vividly, and gaily as he or she can. Mm. And I, I just like that. I, uh, so it's, uh, it's very difficult, but there, I don't think you can say one way or the other, you're a consumer service, no you're not. You're quality control, no you're not actually that either. You are a very odd animal hybrid. Mm. Nick? Well, I d don't count anymore, I don't do it anymore. M M Michael, I think, described me to me uh, fairly recently, I think, as outspoken. 
and whether he meant it as a compliment or not, <laughs> yes, I think I did. I, I, th I, I would go with Polonius, to thy own self be true. And I have been outspoken, and I've been criticized for being outspoken, but I think if you fail to give your response to an experience while, and this is crucial, making it clear the reasons for which you have this response or series of responses, then you have done part of what your function is. But beyond that, I think the need to entertain and interest your audience, whether or not you like or were moved or were enraged or whatever, you have to keep the vitality of the theater going or try to by try and I when I went to the standard somebody said to me you realize your audience will go from company directors to call boys and I always had the notion of a very wide range of sympathies and interests and once having given my own response, I wanted to seduce a wide range of people to go on reading me because they were interested to gather what was going on, whether or not I liked or responded to a piece of theatre. I think that's absolutely right. It is, it is vital not to be boring on the subject of theatre because there are people out there who think theatre in general is boring. I mean, we all, I think all of us, loathe the one to five star system and, and have endless miseries about that. And there's this kind of, there's this thing people say, well, nobody reads a three star review. And of course, you have to have quite a few three star reviews. And so I always think if it's a three star review, you've got to have a cracking first sentence. I did, did you one, star did, your own? Sorry to. Yes. You have to yes, do the star. Yes, it's awful. Put on by but else. you do, I and mean, I did, did one last night, you know, and it, it is a three star thing. It's a very curious, early, mad fairy tale Ibsen at the German Street Theatre, and, and I enjoyed it. But it, it, it was a three star. And so you sort of think, right, first sentence, you think, right, yes. There are goblins playing Tibetan drums. You think people might now read on. You know, <laughs> you've got to start there. Whereas if I had started with, this is an early work by Henry Kibson. <laughs> Three stars, no. So it's, it's, you do have to do a bit of vaudeville, don't you, Michael? Yeah, I mean, Kingsley Amis put it very simply when he was asked about this eternal question, which you must yeah. get asked all the time too, about the function of the novelist. He well, said, the job of the writer is self-entertainment. And I've always thought that was <laughs> yes. fundamentally true, unless you are amusing and engaging yeah. your own self while writing, yeah. it will mm. come out dead as a dodo, yeah. won't it? Is it awful right. when they take out the silly jokes, though? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the irony, the puns, oh, it, it all goes... <laughs> oh, but, the editors just, aren't what they but were. But just, just one other brief thing. Of course, the rules of the game are changing all the time because what is happening now because of the website and the internet is the rapid reaction from the readers. I mean, there have always been reactions from readers, but yeah. they used to be che cheerfully slow, as you know, yes. didn't they? Yeah. Letters would come That's in, it. you know, yeah. two, three, four days after the event. Yeah. Now, no sooner has a review been written. Yeah. I mean, I finished my review. I did my review of Arturo Ui this morning between whatever it was, let's say nine, eight thirty, and 10 o'clock, mm. I think. Mm. Uh, and it was on the website about 11.30, and by 11.32, there were comments, you know. Yeah. So no sooner is the review out there. I yes, don't mind this. It's a different yeah. sort of dialogue. But I'm just yeah. saying it, it does create, I think, an extra kind of pressure, actually. And the pressure is to be even more true to your reaction and not to start worrying about whether you're going to offend, annoy, yeah. irritate the, the readers on the website, because you will anyway. But, but So, I mean, integrity, in a way... Is the, is the key to this, but... Interesting integrity. Interesting integrity. integrity. Interesting, yeah. yes. <laughs> Tibetan drums, always. Um, it, it, yes. What makes it sound a bit pious, but... No, well, I think it, no, it's but, right. But it's inter I think Nicholas is right, yes. You've got to be yeah, no, it's got amusing to be integrity. But mm. te not thinking about the audience reaction, yeah. do you ever feel any of you, um, I suppose, guilty if you're reviewing something in a small theatre as opposed to one of the big ones that can absorb shocks and some box office not being as good as others. If you know that a review, you are being true to yourself and a review could mean that that show comes off, that is quite a big responsibility. And I've always wanted to ask critics what they feel about that. I mean, is, that, is there any role for that? Or do you just have to 
feel it and move on, or do you not feel it? Is, we're not Broadway. We can't close shows down like like sort of New York Times can. But I mean, yes, that there are certain moments. I mean, I love the Southwark Playhouse in London. I think its programming is brave. It's interesting. It's fun. I've had some terrific nights there. They charge 10 to 15 quid. People can go. Commuters at London Bridge. You know, what a wonderful little theatre. But I went to a Philip Ridley play there, which I hated more than I've hated almost anything in the last two years. Oh, you can't not say so. You have to say this is a disgusting man, and it's a disgusting play, and I see no point in it at all. I have to say, having said that, some of my colleagues loved it. So I'm, I'm not entirely right. But yeah, it, it's... Uh, I think, but I don't think you can dare to think that way. You really can't. You can't say, you know, oh, well, this was really, a, you know, a very brave stab, you know, when actually it should have been strangled at birth. Yeah, I think I, all I would say is I think, I mean, the tone of the review might vary if it's a small theatre. I mean, if you're attacking a big musical, uh, I think you have less compunction. As you rightly say, if you're attacking 12 actors of working for nothing anyway in a sort of underheated basement in Tooting Beck, you know. Yes. Um, you, you probably don't come down on the review quite so savage. I remember the late, great Jack Tinker of the Daily Mail saying this. He said, it does seem sometimes ridiculous for me to bring the full weight of the Daily Mail to bear down on some unfortunate fringe <laughs> show. And he was right. I just think you mod moderate the tone without sacrificing your truth. Well, the great thing is, is that there, there are some people who, who they're so grand that critics don't seem to mind being absolutely appalling. You know, the old, this is Trevor Nunn at his worst. Yeah. <laughs> he really <laughs> does get to that. Oh. Hall, like, <laughs> oh, yes, we better not get into this. No, no, we're not going to get into it. No, because Kiss Me Kate is playing to very full houses over the road. Yes. Um, I rather liked it. Uh, well, good. No, this is very good. Um, one of the other things is that, of course, Chichester has always had this reputation oh, yes. for having um, national critics come to visit, not being treated quite like a regional theatre. Now, you guys have seen how regional theatre was very strong and then it rather fell away, and there are signs that certain theatres are coming back again. Do you think that the critic has a big role to play in that, the difference between the big towns, in particular, obviously, the capital city in London, and the regional theatres, that criticism plays a part in how they work together? Uh, does the critic have a role to play? Um, well, yes. I mean, again, it's a, it's a difficult question because, I mean, regional theatre is on the whole embattled at the moment, underfunded, embattled, and a bit beleaguered, and in many cases fighting for its life. And we as critics obviously want to see the regional network survive because what governments never understand is that, you know, you don't have a successful national theatre without a whole range of mm -hmm. talent around the country. Um, but again, even if one believes passion in regional theatre and a theatre may be struggling and you go and see something there that is below par, you still again have to say so. Mm -hmm. So one comes back to this dilemma the critic yeah. faces, actually. You can't treat theatre, I think, as this week's good cause, you know, or as a de deserving charity. It has to survive on its own Merits. Artistic I mean, merits. Artistic merits, precisely, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I was in uh, Northampton seeing a cracking head of Gabler uh, the other night, and I shall be in uh, Scarborough on, on Monday. And I mean, I, I get around quite a lot. But there are times, I mean, it is, again, it's this business of honesty. I mean, I love the Manchester Royal Exchange, and they've had some wonderful stuff. They've had the best private lives I have ever seen with Imogen Stubbs. It was fantastic. They've had, some, they've had a wonderful view from the bridge. But one day I went up there, you know, and stayed in the usual scuzzy bed and breakfast for 25 quid, because all the papers are broke now. And um, <clears throat> Rupert Murdoch gets cracking value out of my senior rail card, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, but uh, the play uh, was about for five women of 50, called Five by 50, and it was awful. The actors, it wasn't the actors' fault. I don't think it was even the director's fault. It was the fault of whoever chose it. It was a dreadful play. I couldn't have not said that just because I loved the Royal Exchange and wanted to encourage it. You, it, you know, you couldn't. Yeah. It was very early in my critiquing days and I upset myself doing it, but I had to say so. Nick, do you? Well, well uh, uh, it was really only in the days when I was Michael's deputy that I stepped out of London and I can always remember the excitement of, say, the Bristol Old Vic of getting a national critic down. And the weight of responsibility was, oh, it was like two lead things on either side. Because it, it, it doesn't feel good to knock some 
something when people have such high expectations of, of getting a review in the nationals and then finding it does that to you. So what can you do? It once again comes back to integrity and not being a public relations voice for the, the theatre. But I think, obviously, Chichester is an entirely different situation in the sense that it's a national festival theatre. It, yes. it, it, it can't be seen as a regional theatre. Chichester is not a, a region. It's a state of mind and being. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, what's uh, absolutely fantastic is when you have plainly been sent up to do something because it is so sendable up. I mean, I went flogging up to Newcastle for Susan Boyle the Musical's opening night. <laughs> and of course, everybody thought this might be absolute hell. And I was sort of thinking, oh, Paul, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, you know, this is going to be, they're sort of expecting something. And actually, it was a really lovely piece of theatre. It was terribly cleverly done. And she came on and sang at the end, and the whole audience just erupted. And actually, it was a story. It was, it was very cleverly built as a sort of story of triumph over, over a difficult beginning. And so that's always a treat. But sometimes you, you do have a vague sense that they're sending you to do something as a bit of a freak show. And um, you just have to take it at whatever value it's actually worth. Moving on to um, the, the part of the reviews, particularly uh, maybe in the 70s and early 80s of Chichester, um, the, one of the most uh, frequently commented upon parts of any review was the audience. Yes. The good old Chichester audience, which you know, Stephen Fry, I think, calls Colonel and Mrs. Chichester. Um, now, <laughs> there, you talk about it in the interview in the book, Michael, but you, I think, all have a view about this, the nature of audiences and what it is about the Chichester audience that always drew such sort of so many comments about blazers, I always thought. Well, <laughs> Le Le <laughs> Leslie Ebershed Martin, who did a terrific thing in creating this, this theatre and sustaining it, was a man of extreme conservative views. And I think he imbued the theatre with something of this ethos. And I, I remember the year that a decision was very bravely taken by, I think it was John Gale, to put on A Patriot For Me. <laughs> and Leslie Evershed Martin was deeply shocked by this. It was rather as though nine, he wasn't so much living in 1964 when the play was done in London as perhaps 1933. And I remember uh, The Guardian wanted me to write a piece about, about this event and trying to speak to Evershed Martin. And I said to him, what have you got against this play? It has a big reputation already and has had for 20 years. And he said, I'm not going to talk about this disgusting play to you, <laughs> as though I'd made an indecent advance to, <laughs> to him. And I think it was a shame in a way that Evershed Martin's influence permeated the theatre a little too long and in the wrong way, when so many exciting, valuable things also happened. And uh, as a result, partly of him, it, I, uh, it gave the theatre uh, uh, an unfortunately intolerant and conservative atmosphere. I remember seeing the Midford girls on the first night and I was saying to Michael at, at tea that I remember feeling that the audience's sympathies went out to Unity Midford, the great Hitler lover. <laughs> and I, I suddenly felt uh, as though I was in Germany in 1935. It was weird and unpleasant. <laughs> I must say the Chichester audience is the most reviewed audience in the world, <laughs> because you're, you're quite right. We would never come down here in the centuries without starting a sentence no, about... No, exactly. Um, <laughs> often about the Daimlers, I seem to remember, uh, you know, disgorging... We uh, gave out eggs lines. when they were coming in, you know, right. so But very good. it's not entirely without foundation, because yeah. my favourite, and I've quoted it many times, my favourite overheard remark was a play called Tavarich. I forgot what year oh, it was, Tavarich, remember, with yes. Natalia... Uh, Natalia Markova and Robert Powell. That's right, yeah. and the, the, um, the lights went up on this gorgeous, well-draped and very um, lush and luscious set, and a voice behind me, a lady behind me said, Ooh, goody, a chaise long. 
<laughs> and you felt her. God was in his heaven and all was right with the yeah, world. Uh, you know, yeah, nothing right. could go wrong from here on in. And actually, Patrick Garland, who directed it, said he overheard a couple as he put it, lovely ladies in behind him. And there is a Chopin mazurka in the original, and he, because it, she was a dancer, of course, he had he had rewritten it for her to do a little dance instead of playing the piano. And when it was finished, this little dance, one lady leant over to the other and said, "You can say what you like, but that girl has had dancing lessons." But just one one quick thing. I mean, I think there is a serious point here, actually, uh, as well as the jokes we make about the the audience, um, and it is this that. I think there have been years and periods when I felt the audience was almost dictating the terms or some directors, artistic directors that is, were playing to that audience or catering to that audience. Well, you may say, why wouldn't you? But I think Chichester, I come back to this again, has always been at its best when the director in charge has challenged the audience and said, no, we can take you beyond your expectations. To do a Patriot for me was a classic example yeah. of that. One example I quoted to you um, as we haven't covered tea was the year in the Minerva when they did a play about Anthony Blunt. And those, some of you may, may remember this actually, Corin Redgrave played Anthony Blunt. And at the end of the show, he got the audience to stand up with him and sing the Internationale. <laughs> and I thought, I would never live to see the day when a, a, a British audience, let alone a British audience, audience yes. stood up and yes. did a sing-along. But it, but it is the fact of the Minerva's arrival has been well. like a shot of vitamin B12 in an <laughs> ailing body, because the impact of the Minerva is important in, in changing the nature of the Chichester audience. I, all I think is I think Chichester audience will go with you if you give them something really yeah. daring. It, it, is, it is certainly true that if you, if you sort of compare with something like the kind of edgy, fresh in from work in a rather excited low ticket price audience at the Young Vic, you know, which goes, oh, no, and so on, you know, has a, a kind of warmth in it, you sometimes feel the Chichester audience has been tranquilized by tea and scones in the <laughs> afternoon, and why not? However, listening and sort of thinking about it, I think we should move on because these were hippie chicks, angry young men, bikers. Some of them will have taken party drugs. You know, I'm 62 now and I'm 60s generation. You know, and I think people tend to sort of assume that anybody who looks as if they've got slightly grey hair and has taken so sort of not wearing miniskirts is probably kind of in some way a fuddy-duddy and it's just not so anymore. You know, yes. we, we, we really are, our generation... Uh, <laughs> we are the Rolling Stones generation, you see. We're not like old Billington here. <laughs> He's still Buddy Holly. <laughs> like the Beatles, come on. Oh, the Beatles. The Beatles. Anyway. The Beatles. Anyway. But also, I mean, I think one of the things that is often overlooked in that, and we, we're, we don't, we're not going to go in, we don't have time to talk about funding and the relationship between, right. you know, how you're supported or not. But it is precisely that, that an audience that has kept a theatre going with no funding for a very large part um, is to be applauded, not commented on their dress sense. But anyway... Um, <laughs> um, but that's why Arts Council funding was vital to Chichester absolutely. and why it has changed the nature of the game. And that's yeah. why it's new writing and classic pieces. Right. and Yes. Now, I want the audience to have a say in a moment, so I'm going to do the very mean thing that I did tell you I was going... I didn't tell Libby, actually, but I'm sure she won't mind, which is to ask you your worst Chichester play that you've reviewed or seen, and then your best. Oh, I never got the worst. Oh, no. did you not get that? OK, oh, well, never mind. T tell well, me something you no, didn't Nick, like. you start. No, you start. <laughs> well, you don't have oh, to. Oh, yeah, you don't I, want uh, to. I, I did but catch sight of one which I thought was <laughs> amazingly dreadful, and I think it was in the 19... 80s you see how useful this book is, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Yes, yes. And I think it was something like Young Heads and Old Hearts. Um, it? Yes, that's right. Dion oh, Boussico, 1980. Bus that's yes. it. It was spectacularly dreadful on the grand scale. Um, m m my two... two no. My two gr great experience... M m um, three, I think, starting obviously with Uncle Vanya, going on with Maggie Smith in The Way of the World in the 1980s and ending remarkably with Rupert Gould's definitive Macbeth. 
Can I just a, a, a great one from each decade? Do you mind? No, brilliant. since I've been here so long. Absolutely, you know. and um, you are, you're the only person who appears in every decade. <laughs> right, uh, I, I'm with Nick. Uncle Vanya, 1960s has to be, doesn't it? Uh, 1970s, my favourite production, An Enemy of the People, with Donald Sindon. I thought that was a great production because it brought out the humour in that play and the absurdity of Dr Stockman and other generations of directors have done so, but at the time that was quite a breakthrough. Uh, um, 80s, Victory, this is again a bizarre choice. This was Patrick Garland's version of The Dynasts by oh, yes. Hardy, this great unwieldy, unstageable epic which started with a procession in the main street and we all joined in the procession and came into the theatre following a band, I think, and then the play was done in a very condensed form. Uh, epic theatre. 19, that was 80s, 90s, I would pick up The Hot House by Harold Pinter, with Harold Pinter yes. in it, uh, playing the Colonel in the Minerva. And acting yeah. under his own name. And acting under his own name, yeah. indeed, yes. Um, and yes, from the, from the noughties, um, yes, I would go with either Macbeth or Rupert Gould's Enron. I mean, what about that? <laughs> that evening was an extraordinary event, and I saw Enron twice afterwards in a West End theatre, and it was never as good as it was in the confined space of the Minerva. It was something about the Wellsian exuberance of the production bursting against the confines of the Minerva yes. that made it quite extraordinary. And just finally, uh, from what decade are we in now? We've gone past the We're in the, the tens. I the know, tens. I don't know how we say Well, I mean, so far, we're only in the 20 20 teens or something. Um, so far, for me, it's Sweeney Todd, which I saw here last year and have again in London. I, I was uh, knocked out by that. Yeah. Um, so it's been a sort of, you know, there's quite a rich spread, actually, yeah. over the decades. I would go for, for, for bests. I mean, I, I've, I've had a pretty lovely time because um, Jonathan Church is, is pretty wonderful, really. Um, uh, I loved the recent Vanya and I loved the Sweeney Todd, which I thought was absolutely stunning. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of pleasure. I, I saw Enron in London and absolutely adored it there. I actually took an accountant with me who kept saying, you can't do that. He can't do that. No, no, no. He did. And she said, oh, but that's that. She, cut. No, she was really upset. She was a company accountant. Um, but as to one's not, not liking, I think, curiously, it was before, just before I started reviewing and I bought actual tickets, I came to see Yes, Prime Minister. And I really, really disliked it. I've always loved the television programme. I thought the actors were superb. But I thought it, was un, it felt unresolved. I, thought, I wanted it to turn out that the Sheikh was a, was a journalist in disguise, which would have been much funnier. And I thought the whole business of the underage girl you know, and, and the sort of the Muslim, the invisible Muslim paedophile in the background. Well, you know, I just, I, I really was uneasy at it. But as I say, the, the, I want to say one more thing about the Vanya, the recent uh, wonderful Uncle Vanya, um, was that my husband said, oh, all right, I will drive you, because we were going on back home to Suffolk. He said, I will drive. He said, but I don't have to come and see this Chekhov thing, do I? And I said, oh, go on. They've offered me a second ticket come. And he came out, he thought it was absolutely wonderful, and he now wants to spend his whole life watching Chekhov. So, <laughs> a convert. <laughs> now, one of the things um, is, this is the anniversary season, and uh, the programme has been for some new plays, some plays that are very important to the history of Chichester. We've mentioned Vanya, we've mentioned Heartbreak House, Way of the World as well, of course. Um, and then the wonderful big house will close, hopefully, for a refurbishment. And so this is about now looking forward. So do you feel that um, this is... What, what, have you seen the plans yet? And what do you feel about the sense of this being the launch for the next 50 years, as it were, whilst looking back at the, the past, where the theatre's come from? Well, I haven't seen the plans, actually, no. No, no, I, um, I just wondered if you might have done um, them. No, no one's disclosed them to us. I mean, I, we've only heard rumours, haven't we? I have, I've anyway, heard, I heard John, Jonathan uh, Church came to talk to the Critics, uh, critics Circle there. meeting, which I think you missed, yeah. um, about, uh, about the plans, and they were very, uh, they, 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 they were fascinating um, and very technical. Um, and okay, it, we won't well, dwell on sounded plans, terrific. Then. There was stuff about the pointy stage and so on. I was, I was impressed. But, I mean, <laughs> what, what, what matters is what happens on the stage or stages, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and so what I hope is the church philosophy, even if it's not Jonathan Church executing it, is continued. And I think Church has found something. He's found a sort of ideal balance, it seems to me, between big, palpably popular shows, like often two musicals a season in the main house, um, and at the same time doing the 
unexpected, the adventurous, the off the wall, the out of the way, you know, and as we talked about this earlier, um, you know, Brecht in the Minerva is a bold move and a very exciting one. Mm. And I think it's going to, I think it's that. And just briefly, I would like to hark back to the often rather abused um, triumvirate who ran the theatre, you know who I mean. Yes. Um, Ru Ruth, Ruth McKenzie, and Martin, Martin, and, Martin and, Duncan and, uh, and Stephen Pimlott, the late Stephen Pimlott, Stephen. the late Stephen Pimlott, who I, seemed to me to be viewed with a certain, um, I don't know, distaste because they didn't do great business, but they did something very vital. They got the Arts Council funding on the proper mm. scale, but they also did a lot of European repertoire, didn't they? They did the Master and Margarita. I think Nathan the Wise was and under Nathan, the... Both of which starred Michael Feast, who's in the Indeed, yeah. Um, and who starred in Nick's play. And I admire them for that, actually, for Europeanizing Chichester more than any other previous director had. So I would like to see Jonathan or his successor carry on that philosophy. Yes, I want to see big shows in the, in the main house, but I also want to see a lot of plays I've never seen before in the Minerva. I think the big question relates to the size of the main house, and I'd be interested to know what the audience, you feel, about the size of the house. Is it too large a house in days when we are used, or a time we have become used to the close to-ness of the internet and, obviously, of television? Uh, I wonder if it just seems too large now. Too large? Can you, would you mind shouting? I know that's rude, but it's impossible to hear otherwise. I think we're very lucky to have the two, actually, because, I mean, these fantastic musicals that we've had, like Seeing in the Rain, I mean, you couldn't do that in, in an enclosed space. So we are very fortunate to have the two. We need the two for the sort of shows we've been having. Right. Libby, yeah. did you want to say anything? Because I'll throw I was, it I was just going to say, uh, as, to, as to what Jonathan Church came and told us all about at Critics Circle, that there's this wonderful thing called snow loading, where if you've got a great big flat roof, you've got to have a certain amount of extra strength in it in case there's very, very, very heavy snow sits on it one day. And so they can stick up all sorts of fancy lights and things which are very heavy, as long as it's summer and it's not going to snow. Of course, now this is getting a bit dodgy. Yeah. Because <laughs> it could any minute. As far I did not know see. it was a floating theatre, Libby. That's what we're going to have. Um, I'm going to throw it open we've got about eight minutes for questions from the audience but you know because I know many of you want your supper um, any questions I will probably repeat them if you don't mind so that the people at the back can hear um, what's been asked right there was somebody up there lady there the, uh, the lady's point was about the actual size of the stage and whether things you know if they weren't perfect sort of died on it and the audience couldn't necessarily hear is that good enough yeah, yeah. asked of Nick well critics don't really have a right to talk. That's why I threw the question out to talk about uh, sizes of theatre in the sense that we get, or in my case got, or in my case still get when I come, exceedingly good seats close to the front. So the sense of Chichester being a huge theatre vanishes quite quickly. Uh, but my, my feeling and it relates to what happened when the RSC had its temporary structure of the uh, roughly, very roughly, equivalent to Chichester. And I remember about 10 people came down from the top, which of course was still very close to the action, but they said, well, we couldn't hear that well, and w we felt that we couldn't direct have direct eye contact with the, uh, with the actors. And so I have become cautiously suspicious about large theatres which are not doing musicals, when they're not doing musicals. I think uh, aud audibility is a really big thing. Sometimes yeah. I've been so worried about a particular thing that in the interval I have dashed up to the top of the circle and said to people, are you hearing him? You know, and sometimes they say no. In, in Gats recently, which wasn't in a very big theatre, where a lot of the stuff is he's reading out of the book like that. You know, it was quite obvious that some people were not getting every word. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, it's an old-fashioned theatre gift, isn't it? As being, you know, a skill, being able to hurl even a whisper to the back of the circle like Judy Dench can. Yes. Well, that's the point. It is. It is an old-fashioned skill which a generation of actors is not trained exactly. even to yeah. use. Um, 
it's not that the theatre's got bigger, it's that the actors got smaller. In the <laughs> sense, you know. yeah. um, and an actor of the, say, let us say, Don Sinden generation, I think yes. never had My any boy. problem yeah. in <laughs> filling the cubic capacity of the Chichester Festival Theatre. Two theatres, in the case of John <laughs> well, Yes, at least, yes. But Donald is part of a generation that was yeah. physically trained to do this. Uh, we all know the pattern today is very different. Young actors go quickly into TV or fringe theatre. And therefore, I guess, for the first time when they come to this theatre, it must be slightly mm. overwhelming, yeah. actually, yeah. playing that stage. But I don't think it's beyond the capacity of uh, actors to learn how to use it. Yeah. Um, and I think the days when we worried about actors having to circle around, you know, play to every sector of the audience, I, I never find this a problem. Yeah. No, I don't not notice do I. It no, 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 yeah. no, no. So I think a lot of the fears of the thrust stage have evaporated with time. And now I feel disappointed when I go into a theatre that is not actually an yes. open stage. Yes. yes. Can I tell my Donald Sinden story very quickly? Perfect. Um, I, he, he once, I, we, were, we were doing a thing together, some kind of pan, panel or other, and he, he taught me his warm-up to get his voice going, every consonant and every vowel, and it just went hand basin, hand basin, lavatory, lavatory, bidet, 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 douche. <laughs> Isn't that magnificent? <laughs> Never been able to forget it. <laughs> There's a comment from the lady in the front and then the gentleman there. I think, I think it's actually to do with the actors, not the size of the stage, is always my experience. And I think it's interesting with the stars. You're talking about the stars coming in to, to do plays and Grandage is doing a new season coming up. And some of the stars who are big in film or TV can't carry a stage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And some of them, I think you can tell, I mean, like, Jude Law really surprised me. I think he must have been, I didn't realise he'd been stage trained, but some of them clearly have not been through the same, or to me, don't seem as though they've been through the same acting training. Well, directors Sorry, sit in at the third mind? or fourth row, and uh, they don't, don't realise this. <laughs> It, the, the, the comment was about the actors, particularly the big names that have come from film, that they simply can't, they don't have the projection and they can't carry the stage. So some of them will work and some of them won't. And then, sorry, Nick, I interrupted no, I, you. No, it's just I've, poor I've people really at the back, you can't hear, I've, can you? No, no, no. I've, I've, I think I've made my point. I hope okay. I've made my point. <laughs> Gentleman there, did you have a question? Yes, it's, it's related to that, those earlier two questions. As critics, do you always sit in the same seats to do your review? And do you expect to sit in the same part of the <laughs> when you come to Chichester? Thank you. That's a lovely question. It was, as critics, do they sit in the same seats in the same theatre when they go there? And do they expect to sit in those seats? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> always. And having begun my... Pref I mean, having... Um, what's the word? Sort of trained as a critic myself, you know, yeah. by sitting in the uncomfortable, cheap awful seats in theatres. I'm buggered if I'm going to go back to that. <laughs> you know, um, I think after all these years, you know. And it also, don't forget, we're working. I mean, this is another serious yeah. point, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> believe it, we are working. Libby tonight, I'm not under such pressure. Libby tonight is under pressure to get a review done, you know, by 11 o'clock or whatever. Um, even simple things, uh, 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 ex-critic, dead critic, uh, John Barber of the Daily Telegraph used to say, Michael, there's a very important reason for us to sit near the stage. I said, why is that? He said, the light from the stage enables us to actually see our notes. It's, yes, it may good. sound very banal, that, it's, but it's yes, very, it's very, good. very yes. simple. Yes, I can't see mine at all. You need an island seat. Uh, most theatres will give you an island seat so that you can do your desperate, that embarrassing critic scuttle. You know, as uh, Richard Eyre said, scuttling up the aisle like rats up an alley. You know, when you've got, <laughs> you've got to an overnight, because you can't get out of a West End theatre in less than 30 minutes sometimes and and I love an island seat where I've got my right arm so that I can write without okay. annoying the person next to me because I can't read my writing anyway and once I'm doing it like this in the pitch dark it is it is um it can be quite stressful so you you do want to but interestingly out of London they tend not to give you island seats and they very often give you seats quite a long way back Indeed. West Yorkshire Playhouse will shove you any old where you know <laughs> that, that's good for us it's good for the humility but have you noticed Libby, Libby the, f the further we go out of London the worse the seats get actually except I mean, in Chichester except in Chichester <laughs> yes, yes. Absolutely. but by the time you get to Scotland you're in Rose Z I've yeah. noticed that. <laughs> now I'm talking about scuttling I'm sorry to have to bring this to an end because this has been an absolute delight um, but it is ten past six I know many of you are going into Heartbreak House um, it has been one of those panels I think we, we can all feel that we've had a real little personal insight into how it works. Um, 
and I was going to ask you to thank them in a second, but I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow night, the pre-performance talk, is David Hare, and he is talking about Bernard Shaw's own favourite play, Heartbreak House, and that will be in the Festival Theatre, and that is at quarter to six. And then the 19th, this time next week, I'll be talking to Gareth Valentine, and that is at five o'clock, because we like to keep you all on your toes. No thing starts at the same time. And that will also be in the Festival Theatre, and he's been the musical director for Kiss Me Kate. So it's a follow-on for the interview that I did a couple of weeks ago with Trevor Nunn, for any of you who came to that. But it therefore simply remains to say an enormous thank you to Nicholas de Jong, Michael Belitting, Livy Purvis, and to you, the wonderful Chichester audience. <laughs>